we were talking last time uh, briefly about a couple of sort of weird reactions that, that uh, are a little bit out of place but are never, nevertheless have to do with carbonyl chemistry and which you may encounter on future standardized exams. I was talking about the Wittig reaction, which is a reaction between an aldehyde or a ketone and uh, a weird reagent called the Wittig reagent or the ILID. So uh, this is a nucleophilic reagent. You make it starting with an alkyl halide. You react it with um, a phosphorane. Maybe that's not what this is called. It's, it's not an, it's the phosphine, it's, no, it's a phosphine, sorry. That doesn't matter. Uh, but in the same way that uh, an NH3 compound is an A as an amine, phosphorus is one row down on the periodic table from nitrogen. So this is a phosphine. You don't need to remember that. I'm just writing it down so I don't forget again. Um, anyway, you do the SN2 reaction between phosphorus and uh, the alkyl halide, and you get this phosphonium salt. Notice that... Uh, it's called phosphonium in the same way that a nitrogen bonded to four things with a positive charge is called ammonium. Uh, you remove the proton adjacent to the phosphorus group with a really, really strong base. This is an organolithium reagent. And that creates this reagent that's nucleophilic on this negatively charged carbon. Uh, now, some people prefer to draw, and this is called... Again, it's not particularly important other than your text uses the term. It's called an ILID because it's got a positive and negative charge on adjacent atoms. Uh, that's not a particularly important term for you to remember, but you may encounter it. Some people prefer to draw the resonance structure where we take these electrons, kick them down to form a double bond with phosphorus. Uh, for some of you, that should give you a little bit of heartburn because that's five bonds to phosphorus, and we've been taught never to draw five bonds to second row elements. But phosphorus is not a second row element, and it actually can form more than, uh, more than four bonds. That's, that's mostly an issue of its increased size relative to nitrogen. You can draw the resonance structure for this in any way you like. I prefer this ILID form because we're gonna use these electrons as nucleophile in the next step. So uh, I, you're not responsible for this mechanism, but I'm walking you through it so that uh, you can see sort of what happens and, that, and how it happens, and that may help you remember what happens. Uh, nucleophile, negatively charged carbon, attacks carbonyl carbon, attacks the pi star at the carbonyl carbon. Pi bond breaks. So far, it's just exactly the same as we've seen before with addition reactions to carbonyls. The weird part is here where the oxygen attacks the phosphorus. Uh, why does this happen? Well, phosphorus is there and it's close is reason number one. Reason number two is phosphorus can form more than four bonds. And then reason number three, oxygen phosphorus bonds are really stable. So uh, it makes sense rather than have a negatively charged oxygen here, and a positively charged phosphorus here, it makes sense to have you make a new bond. Uh, this is a four-membered ring intermediate. Uh, you might imagine there's a lot of ring strain there, except for the fact that phosphorus is bigger, and so the, these bonds are a little bit longer, so it's not quite as strained. In any case, what we see happen next is a concerted uh, rearrangement where the two electrons from the carbon-phosphorus bond kick down to form the new carbon-carbon pi bond, and then the electrons from the oxygen-carbon bond kick up here to form a new phosphorus-oxygen pi bond. So our products are the alkene, and uh, if there are stereoisomers possible, they will form two. Uh, we're not going to worry about whether or not you can control whether you get the E versus Z isomer. And then the other product we're gonna draw is simply the one with the phosphorus oxygen double bond. This molecule is called triphenylphosphine oxide and it is very stable and so formation of this 
uh, product uh, drives the reaction forward because of its uh, uh, because of its strong stability. Um, okay, so the Wittig reaction is a great way to stitch two different parts together. Uh, your text takes you through some retrosynthesis where you think about um, it shows you a molecule like this and then says, okay, how would you have made this from a uh, via a Wittig reaction? Find the carbon carbon double bond. Uh, if there's if one of the two could have been made from a primary alkyl halide, you'll choose that one. We could have gotten the phosphonium salt and then the illid. And then on this side, where the double bond was, we put the carbonyl oxygen. So that's worth a little bit of practice. Uh, it may, if, if you uh, studied ozonolysis last semester, this is a reaction that can clip a double bond in two into two separate parts. It's, it's not exactly the reverse of ozonolysis, but it's like stitching two separate parts together via a double bond. So you can sort of think of it uh, that way. Okay, anything you want to ask about that? Mostly what I want you to know is how to predict products or think backward from product to starting material. I'm not going to ask you about the mechanism. Okay. That's enough of that then. So um, we're going to spend a little bit of time today on chapter 15, which is about acids and bases. And then we will move on to chapter 16, which is about nucleophilic acyl substitution, or uh, what happens when you add to a carbonyl compound and the tetrahedral intermediate has a decent leaving group. Okay, so uh, chapter 15 is about carboxylic acids and nitriles. I'm going to say basically nothing about nitriles. I showed you a reaction last time that involved a nitrile, and, and other than that, we won't talk about it. But let's briefly talk about carboxylic acids. This is a review from 351, and so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I expect you to be able to reason through why, for example... this uh, trichloroacetic acid is more acidic than its monochloroacetic uh, acid counterpart. So the pKa of this proton here is like 2.8. The pKa of a carboxylic acid proton is around 4. Uh, I don't actually have in my notes what the pKa of the trichloro is. Uh, but it should be around one, or maybe close to zero, okay? The more electron withdrawing groups you put adjacent to the carboxylic acid, the more acidic it is. Remember that when we're judging the acidity of compounds, we always draw the conjugate base. More, uh, more acidic molecules have more stable conjugate bases. What, is, uh, what makes a conjugate base more stable? Well, uh, it spreads out electron density either via resonance or via an inductive effect due to nearby electronegative groups. In this case, the more nearby electronegative groups you have, the more you generate uh, an electron-poor carbon alpha to the carbonyl carbon, and that tends to pull electron density away from the negatively charged conjugate base. If the conjugate base is more stable, then the corresponding acid is more acidic. That's hopefully, hopefully you got that. Any, any questions or issues? Okay. Um, this shows up uh, in some other forms, for example, and we don't necessarily need to say a lot about this, but um, you can compare the acidity of, say, benzoic acid with, uh, say, para-nitro-benzoic acid. Uh, nitro is an electron withdrawing group. If we draw the conjugate base of this molecule uh, and then consider what the nitro group actually looks like, 
Uh, you can see, oops, I'm making stuff up here. You can see how we could draw a resonant structure in which we withdraw electrons from the benzene ring into the nitro group. That would put a positive charge inside the benzene ring adjacent to the carboxylic acid. Um, now this positive charge can't stabilize this negative charge via, via resonance. There's no way to take this negative charge and kick it down into the ring, but it can be adjacent to that group and pull electron density away as though it were a very electronegative atom. And that can stabilize the, the conjugate base and make the molecule with the nitro group more acidic. So, um, be able to answer questions about that. Uh, if you need some review, go back to chapter two or read more thoroughly in, uh, in chapter 15. Uh, I wanna talk about um, something now that, I, that I'm not sure whether or not you got in 351. <coughs> <coughs> Great. <coughs> Excuse me, went down the wrong. I'm really not emotional. It's just that <coughs> I'm coughing. Uh, um, I, just all, I just get so verklempt when I'm talking about organic chemistry. It's so near and dear to my heart. Okay, so when you were in general chemistry, and I'm probably misspelling these guys' names, you maybe learned about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And uh, you may be groaning inside, and if you are, that's fine. Uh, you probably use this as a way to ask the question, if I want to make a buffer whose pH is a specific value, how much of an acid versus its conjugate base should I mix together to, to hit that pH exactly? And that's useful, but that's sort of, um, that's sort of, I don't know, that's sort of t maybe terrestrial level use of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation in the sense that most of you are not gonna be making buffers. I suppose if you work in a biochem or cell bio lab, you may be making buffers, but, uh, but that's not particularly hard. We, however, we can use this equation to understand whether or not a particular acid should either be in its acid form or conjugate base form at a particular pH. So I'm just gonna show you where this comes from. Uh, please do not worry about uh, memorizing the derivation. I like to show you the derivation because I sometimes can't remember the equation myself unless I derive it. Um, so there's an equilibrium constant in the equilibrium between an acid and water versus hydronium and the conjugate base of the acid. Uh, this equilibrium constant is equal to the concentration of hydronium times the concentration of the conjugate base divided by the concentration of HA and the concentration of water. Probably in general chemistry, they told you something like the activity of water is one, so therefore we're just going to drop it out. Um, that may be true, but we're going to pretend like it's not, and the math actually works out, so we're gonna just forget about activity and activity coefficients. Um, if we take this water and multiply both sides by the concentration of water uh, and treat it like a constant, uh, we can rearrange this equation as follows. The reason that's reasonable to do is because uh, in, at, at any reasonable concentration of acid and conjugate base, the concentration of water is constant. Uh, pure water is 55 molar, so it's pretty hard to change that even, uh, even by a large amount at any pH at all. Um, so we're gonna treat that like it's constant and we're gonna call this a new acid dissociation constant, Ka. Um, by the way, you may have been tempted to draw this in the past as Ka equals H plus A minus and HA. If you've done that, that's fine, but you're going to not do that anymore. An acid doesn't just dissociate. It doesn't just go to proton 
and electron. There's in water no such thing as a proton floating around by itself. In water, what happens is water acts as a base and removes a proton from the acid. Okay, good on that. Uh, so I'm going to erase this blasphemy over here, lest you think that it's um, reasonable. All right, so we got our equation for Ka. Now um, I'm going to define pKa as the negative log of Ka. The reason we do this is because Ka values vary from 10 to the minus 40 to 10 to the 15, and we don't really like to use exponents if we can avoid it. Uh, we're lazy, and so we're using a log to make the numbers easier to deal with. We're using the minus so that uh, pKa tracks with free energy. That is, negative values of pKa are for good acids, whereas positive values of pKa's are for less good acids. Um, we'll also recall the definition that pH equals minus log of hydronium concentration, such that high pH means very low hydronium concentration. Uh, all right, so let's take the minus log of both sides of this equation, pKa equals minus log of this quantity. And if you use some properties of logarithms, which we don't need to review, uh, you can rearrange all of this to pH plus, or rather, let's see, minus log of A minus over HA. Alternatively, you could rearrange this to pKa minus pH equals log of acid concentration divided by concentration of conjugate base. All right, I'm doing some things quick in there with respect to logarithms and some logarithmic properties. Um, so don't worry about it if you're not following it. The most important thing is how we deal with this equation. And we're basically going to, de to determine what the ratio is between an acid and its conjugate base. We simply must compare the pKa of the acid to the pH. So this is a new use that you maybe haven't encountered before. Why does this matter? Why would you do this? Um, who in their, in their right mind could possibly care about this? Well, people in my lab do um, because I make them. Uh, and this is uh, a crude drawing of an alpha helix. Uh, and I'm going to draw some of the side chains that occur on amino acids in a protein. We'll come back to this, but it's useful. And I'm gonna draw these amino acids in their fully acidic forms. And then we're gonna consider what form is uh, the major form at uh, physiological pH. So the amino acid lysine has an ammonium group on the side chain. Uh, that's the letter that's lysine is letter K if you know your amino acid codes. The amino acid um, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or, uh, asp or arginine has uh, a pKa of 12. It's got a guanidinium group. Uh, the pKa of the ammonium group is like 11. Uh, that's the amino acid R which happens to be the pirate's favorite amino acid. Arr, bor, sorry. Um, I was telling my son, Dallin, that uh, when you become a dad in the hospital before you go home, they give you a manual of dad jokes to use and that if people groan when you give a dad joke, that that is actually the desired reaction, so. <laughs> Um, all right, there's uh, side chains that are carboxylic acids. There are side chains that are benzene rings that also have OH groups on them. And there are more, let's see, exotic side chains that look something like this. Oh, we're getting email, that's embarrassing. Close, okay. Uh, and let's see, the pKa of, seriously? All right. 
I'm very sorry. <laughs> now I'm... Uh, mail quit okay sorry about that uh, so I'll write the, I'll show you the acidic protons on each of these groups one is one of those protons one of these protons that one that one and that one and I'll write the PKAs by each of them this one is 10 and this one is 6 do I care that you memorize side chain structures? No. Do I care that you memorize PKAs? No. But given a side chain structure and given a PKA, do I care whether you, whether you can uh, figure out if the side chain should still have its proton or not? Absolutely. So let's look for each of these, okay? Let's suppose that we are in uh, the cytoplasm or in the extracellular matrix and the pH is 7.4. Let's go uh, acid by acid and use this equation to determine what happens. So pKa is 11, pH is 7.4. 11 minus 7 is a positive number. Then what should the ratio inside that log be if it equals a positive number? Greater than 1, less than 1, equal to 1. Greater than 1, right? So that tells you that if pKa is greater than pH, the, con the acid form dominates and the proton is still on, okay? So at pH 7, uh, what should be the form of the side chain uh, shown here for lysine? It should, still be in its it should still be in its acid form. How about for the arginine side chain, pKa 12? 12 minus 7 is a positive number, so still the conjugate acid, sorry, the acid form uh, dominates. And what that tells you is these two side chains are positively charged at physiological pH. That is critically important because positively charged groups tend to be on the surfaces of proteins rather than on the inside where they can be uh, on the surface they can be surrounded by water molecules and they can also engage in interactions with negatively charged side chains so this is really important for protein folding and structure uh, how about this carboxylic acid side chain five minus 7.4 is a negative number so which form dominates Conjugate base, so that side chain is going to be negatively charged at physiological pH. So that negatively charged amino acid could, side chain could engage in a salt bridge or ion-ion interaction with either of these. Um, how about this one, pKa10, acid form or base form at pH 7? Acid form, right? Uh, so that proton is still there, so that group would be neutral. How about this one, pH uh, of 7, pKa of 6? The base form should dominate, but by how much? Not a whole lot. Remember that log units are sort of <coughs> successive factors of 10, so uh, 6 minus 7 is minus 1.4. That tells you that there's maybe 10, maybe a little bit less than 10% uh, acid form and uh, maybe a little bit more than 90% base form. This is important actually because this side chain needs to access both negative, both uh, positively charged forms and neutral forms to do chemistry in the active sites of enzymes and we'll see examples of that a little bit later. So be prepared for me to draw a horrendous looking scary molecule with lots of different acidic groups on it, be prepared to look at a pKa table and be able to identify groups that could exist in an acid form or a base form, and then use the pKa to determine whether that group is gonna still have its proton or not. In particular, I really am encouraging you, if you struggle with amines, let me just show you a problem that people encounter when I do this. When I give a problem like this, I often show the amino acid in its neutral form. 
And uh, that's particularly troublesome for amino groups because amino groups have two different pKa's. The pKa for going from the neutral amine to the negatively charged amide is 38. In contrast, the pKa from going, for going from the positively charged ammonium to the neutral amine is 11. So you can see that if you got the wrong pKa, some people will look at this problem and say, oh, okay, well, that pKa is 38, therefore that proton is still on and this group is neutral. Well, I agree with you that that proton is still on at pH 7, but then so is that one. So at pH 7, it's actually gonna be positively charged. So be careful, be aware of the fact that amino groups have a positively charged ammonium form and that you need to consider that in these kinds of problems, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if there's a problem on your practice exam that looks like that, but I can, I can post one on the content page of Learning Suite so you can get an idea of what I've done previously. Yes? So maybe it's not relevant, but could you scroll back up real quick? I'm just a little confused. How does the amino group, the first one on the left, have a, or is it more acidic than the one right next to it? Okay, yeah, so um, I think the comparison is between this uh, sp3 hybridized nitrogen versus this sp2 hybridized nitrogen. Um, and if that were all that was going on here, I think, uh, I think you, you have a point in that you expect uh, sp2 hybridized, for example, CH bonds to be more acidic than sp3 hybridized CH bonds. But there's another issue here, and that is resonance stabilization. So I can, oops, I can actually delocalize that negative charge onto either of those two nitrogen, or that positive charge onto either of those two nitrogens via resonance. So yeah, you can have re resonance stabilization of a positively charged acid. <coughs> that spreads out uh, and stabilizes the positively charged form. Okay, other questions? Yeah. So let me just make sure I understand fully your, the whole thing with the PKA. Basically, PKA is greater than pH, the acid dominates, and the hydrogen stays. If PKA is greater than pH, the acid dominates, the hydrogen stays. Yes. <coughs> yep. I, I hesitate to memorize words like that because I'm sure I'll get it wrong. So I derive the equation every time. <laughs> um, uh, or I get so used to it that I just, uh, I don't, I've, I've got it in my head. Anyway, this will take some practice, but be sure you can do that. It will be useful to you in biochemistry. It will be useful to you in future biology classes. I now want to show you just a couple of uh, important acid groups that you might encounter in biology. Um, one of them is the, the phosphate family. So here is phosphoric acid. That's the structure of something that you've probably written before as H3PO4. Uh, the pKa of the first proton, of course, all of these are equivalent. The first one to come off uh, is 2.2. Uh, so at physiological pH, that proton should not be there, right? So here is the mono... Uh, I'm not sure actually what we call this other than I'm going to call it the mono anion. Uh, and you could write H2PO4 minus and that would work. Uh, the second proton to come off uh, has a pKa of 7.2. Now you could ask why is its pKa so much higher and, that, and the reason is once you already have a negative charge it's tougher to go from one negative charge to two than it is to go from none to one. Uh, this is the dianion, or HPO42 minus. Uh, and then the last pKa is 12. And I'm gonna need to shrink things.
The last pKa is 12, and that will take you to the trianion, uh, which is just PO4, 3 minus. Now, you tell me, at physiological pH, should we have any of this H3PO4? No, because pH is less than pKa, so the conjugate base form would dominate. Uh, should we have any of PO4, 3 minus? Also not, because uh, the pKa to go from this one to this one is 12. That's greater than pH of 7, if pH equals 7.4. Uh, therefore, this proton should still be on. What about this? What about the second proton to come off? What about the equilibrium between monoanion and dianion? Pretty close, right? Like pH is basically equal to pKa, and when that happens, you basically have a close to one-to-one -one mixture of the two. So at physiological pH, you're going to have both of these forms present. Your textbooks in biology and biochemistry are mostly going to ignore this, and they're going to call this PI for inorganic phosphate which is okay, uh, but you should remember that uh, at pH 7, phosphate groups are going to have at least one negative charge and some of them are going to have two. Okay, where does this show up? Uh, all over the place. So, for example, uh, when we get to talking about glycolysis, we're going to draw glucose 6-phosphate which glucose is a cyclic hemiacetal, like we just talked about, but there's a phospho group on the uh, six hydroxy group. And uh, you could draw it this way, but the first pKa of this functional group is again around 2.2, whereas the second is around 7.2. So at pH 7, the real form you're going to have is at least one negative charge and you're going to have at least 50% with two negative charges. I will sometimes abbreviate this as OPO3 2 minus. Uh, by the way, this functional group is called a phosphoester because you have what used to be phosphoric acid and we've replaced one of these OH groups with an alcohol. So just like an ester, it's a phosphoester. Um, okay, uh, DNA is similar, so, um, and this may be the first, I don't know, maybe you already know this, but this, I'm gonna draw just the phosphate backbone of DNA. These are sugars which are themselves attached to the familiar bases, but you've heard of DNA and RNA as being called nucleic acids. This is why they are acids. Have you ever been perturbed by that? You call them acids, and yet if we focus on these bases and base pairs. We're just talking about different parts of the molecule, right? Uh, this is the sugar phosphate backbone. It's a phosphodiester because you've replaced two of the OH groups in phosphoric acid with OR groups. The remaining OH group still has a pKa of around 2.2. So at pH 7... Uh, or 7.4, whatever you want to call physiological pH, that group is going to be negatively charged, and that's really important for DNA structure. The, the phosphate backbone is negatively charged. There's counter ions that interact, and, and uh, any transcription factors that need to bind to DNA to encourage uh, uh, transcription uh, have to deal with that negatively charged backbone. Okay. So I think that just about does it for acids and bases. There's more we could say, but that's perhaps enough. Okay, other questions you want to ask? Yes? So, um, so when it's just about acid and then, uh, does, is it only like On the, on the, 
Okay, the question is here, are all of the H's 2.2? Um, yes and no, okay? So in this phosphoric acid, all of those are equal, but once you take off one of them, the pK of the other two increases. Because once you have one negative charge, it's harder to get two. Uh, that's a good, let's see, so if you had three molecules of this phosphoric acid, is it, is it a stereoisomer if it gets this proton versus that one versus that one? In this case, no, because um, if you made a model, each one of those you could rotate and it would be the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Others? All right. So let's now move on to carboxylic acids and nucleophilic acyl substitution. Um, and I feel like beginning with the hardest stuff and then we'll end with the easy stuff. I prefer to spend most of our time in class on the more difficult things and then the easier things uh, if we don't get to you have a better shot of understanding them based on what the text gives you. So um, we're going to begin with a carboxylic acid and we're going to try to convert it into an ester. And we're going to need some other alcohol to do this. <clears throat> now the problem is that uh, the alcohol is not that great of a nucleophile. And the other problem is the carboxylic acid is acidic on this proton, right? We've just described how that proton has a pKa of like four or five. So uh, the, the alcohol's too, not a good enough nucleophile to attack directly. You could say, well, let's just use the conjugate base of the alcohol, but if you did that, the first thing that would happen is you remove a proton from the carboxylic acid and then you're done. So we're going to need acid catalysis. And that's going to convert the carboxylic acid into a good, leave, into a good electrophile, good enough for the alcohol to attack. So how do we do this? <clears throat> uh, first, you protonate the carboxylic acid. This is Familiar, we had to do this when making acetals and imines and enamines in order to make the carbonyl compound a good enough electrophile to attack. Remember that protonating the carbonyl oxygen makes the resonance structure where there's a positive charge on the carbon even more favorable. And so uh, now that is even more electrophilic. Electrophilic enough for the alcohol oops, to attack. So the nucleophile attacks the carbonyl compound at the pi star, which is mostly on carbon. Attacking the pi star breaks the carbon-oxygen pi bond. So far, this should be uh, totally familiar and look very similar to things you've seen previously. That will give us a tetrahedral intermediate. Now, as we look at that tetrahedral intermediate, I'm going to use the color green for a good leaving group. And right now, it's that protonated alcohol that is the good leaving group. But if you look at where we want to end up, we want that alcohol group to stay in the molecule. So we've got to do some proton transfer. We've got to do the proton transfer shuffle in order to change who's the good leaving group. Fortunately, we have the conjugate base of our acid which can remove a proton from the protonated alcohol. That gets us to this tetrahedral intermediate where suddenly nothing is a good, oops, sorry about that. One of those is an OR group. Nothing is a good leaving group. And then our 
catalytic acid can protonate one of the OH groups, thereby turning it into a good leaving group. Again, we'll use the color green to indicate the good leaving group. Now, because that group is positively charged, it is totally reasonable for lone pair electrons on either of those oxygens to kick down and kick off neutral water as a leaving group. In so doing, we trade one positively charged intermediate for another. Water here left. And then all we need is for the conjugate base <clears throat> to remove a proton from the oxonium ion. <clears throat> and that will give us the ester as our product. Okay? <clears throat> So this is a way of converting a carboxylic acid to an ester under <clears throat> catalytic acid, acidic conditions. Now this should look a little bit to you like acetal formation in the sense that uh, we're protonating a carbonyl first so that an alcohol can attack. Then we're doing the proton transfer shuffle to change who's the good leaving group. Uh, and in the end, water leaves. And just as in uh, acetal formation, we're going to take advantage of water leaving. We're going to remove the water, either by distillation or with some hygroscopic salt to soak up that water. That's going to push the equilibrium all the way to the product ester, okay? And uh, this process uh, has a name. Uh, this acid catalyzed process has a name. It's called Fischer esterification. Um, have you done that already in 353, those of you that are doing it? Okay. So what did you do to soak up the water? You used what? Sodium sulfate or silica? Either of those would work actually. What's that? Both. Okay. Yeah, both of them are hygroscopic and will soak up the water, and so that pushes the equilibrium this way. Um, it's called esterification because you're making an ester. So we're really very creative in OCHEM when it comes to naming reactions. They're either named after dead guys or after the process with ification at the end, and, uh, or both. And you got the, we got the big winner here with the name <laughs> after the dead guy and the process ification. Okay, so this is how you make esters, and esters, uh, low molecular weight esters are particularly smelly. Some of them have fruity types of smells. The ones you made in 353, what was it, banana? Yeah, the banana smell. Um, and a lot of these are used as artificial sort of flavorings or, or smellings. Um, now, it turns out you can run this reaction just as with acetal hydrolysis, we can do ester hydrolysis under exactly the same conditions, except we're going to use an excess of water. We're gonna use an aqueous acid, hydronium, and an excess of water. That's gonna regenerate the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, sometimes in organic chemistry, we want to protect an acid to get rid of the acidic proton so we can do other things. Uh, and one of the ways you can protect carboxylic acids is as an ester. Uh, and so you might want to hydrolyze the ester to get these products, okay? I'm not going to show you that mechanism because it's exactly backwards of um, the Fischer esterification mechanism. All the intermediates are the same. You would simply need to start at the end, 
protonate the carbonyl group, have water attack, proton transfer to choose who's the good leaving group, and then alcohol leaves, okay? So it's probably worth your time to take, take a moment in your studies and try to draw this mechanism in the reverse. Uh, and if you have a hard time doing that, you need to come talk to me or one of the TAs and they can walk you through that. Um, all right, there's another way to break apart esters and this one's historically very important. Uh, you, could cons you could call it uh, ester hydrolysis under basic conditions which is a lot of words. We will also call it saponification, and it's called saponification because this is the reaction that our ancestors used to make soap from animal fat. Uh, so how does this reaction work? Well, you have an ester, and then you use a strong nucleophile in the form of hydroxide, hydroxide and water. OH minus is a strong enough nucleophile to attack the ester directly. That generates a tetrahedral intermediate with a negative charge on the oxygen. These electrons could now kick down and kick off either OR minus or OH minus. If we kick off OH minus, that's just going back to the starting material. If we kick off OR minus, we generate the carboxylic acid and the negatively charged alkoxide group. Now, the reason this reaction works so well is because as soon as OR minus leaves, you now have an acidic proton. So it's very easy, I guess I'd better Draw that out. It's very easy for electrons on the OR minus to remove a proton. This proton with pKa around five, uh, and that's essentially irreversible because the conjugate acid of the alcohol has a pKa of 16. So um, the equilibrium constant is something like 10 billion or something like that. And so uh, this step is no longer reversible. You don't have to play with the equilibrium at all. You get the alcohol and then you get the negatively charged acid, which you can protonate again in aqueous workup simply by lowering the pH. So that's called ester saponification. We do it all the time in the lab, but the most interesting thing, I think, uh, is to consider what happens with fats and oils when you do this. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so we will pick up that discussion next time. Have a good Wednesday, and I will see you Friday.